The other side effects that we're hearing about are uh, rebound weight, right? People go off of it and then they gain all the weight back. Well, here's the thing. Let's just put this in perspective. These drugs, I'll tell you the mechanism of action. These drugs do a couple things. One, they work centrally in the brain to decrease appetite. So they work on your ghrelin and your leptin and they decrease appetite. So you're less hungry. In the biohacking community, they're using that for intermittent fasting and for body composition. So there's that. There is some insulin secretion. You would think, oh my gosh, if insulin resistance is the problem, then having more insulin on the scene is a bigger problem. But especially when it comes to terzepatide, there is an insulin sensitization that happens. So the body and the cells become resensitized to insulin, which is freaking phenomenal. If you ask me, like that's the miracle drug part. So we've got this insulin secretion thing happening, but even with the semaglutide groups, they're still showing marked improvement in their diabetes. So it's, we don't have it all figured out with, if it's elevating insulin just a bit, why therefore would we have improvement in insulin resistance? But we are seeing that it's, it does all kinds of great things when it comes to your overall metabolism and the way glucose is handled in your body. Again, it decreases appetite. It decreases inflammation in the brain. I think a lot of what's driving a lot of this, the busted metabolic health and the comorbidity of obesity, it's like chicken and egg, which comes first, right? But I think a lot of that's coming from a central situation from a brain. So if we can decrease inflammation in the brain, we can do a lot of good for people. I also think that would significantly decrease people's pain. I do believe that some folks hurt more the heavier they get. And it's not just a weight on the joints issue. It's not just an actual mechanical issue on the joints. There's something about fat cells secreting their site. They secrete cytokines when we Add a, when we fill up our fat cells, our adipocytes, we are creating a more cytokine prone environment for sure. And so I think that that can be a feed forward mechanism that's driving a lot of people's joint pain, musculoskeletal pain, depression. Of course, there's a lot to talk about and unpack when it comes to neuroinflammation. But trust me on this one, I understand that field very well. And if we can decrease neuroinflammation, we're talking holy grail type of treatment here. There's very few things that do that. So we've got all these different mechanisms of action and the side effects themselves are not as significant and as horrific as we're being led to believe. There's also a, don't mind my lighting, my peppy is playing with the curtains and he's, but he's being quiet at least. So there's also the concern, of course, about cancer. You're hearing concerns about cancer. Well, if you go to the Wegovi website, it actually gives you the pop-up and it tells you about the cancer. This was a specific type of thyroid cancer found in rats, not found in humans, found in rats. So that's as far as they got with proving that one. Not to say it's not a real risk. If you've had thyroid cancer, you should, of course, in, in every case, I'm not your doctor. The, full disclaimer, I am simply providing all this information for education purposes. And so I'm not going to talk specifics of dosing. I'm not going to talk specifics of how to use it, but I am just trying to educate you on how it works and some of the data that I found. So with the cancer, if, of course, if somebody has had thyroid cancer, be concerned and talk to your doctor. But what I'm finding is a lot of doctors don't understand these drugs again, because I don't think this is being done right. And I'll talk about that in a moment. The other big concern is pancreatic issues. So let's talk about that a minute. When you lose a significant amount of weight really fast, you definitely can put a load on your pancreas and confuse things. You can put a huge load on your gallbladder. You can put a huge load on your pancreas. Your gallbladder, your pancreas, your intestines, your stomach, they're all kind of like BFFs. Liver is in there. So when something goes wrong with, especially gallbladder, pancreas, liver, when something goes wrong with one, something usually goes wrong with all of them to some degree. And so I've had patients with gallbladder stones who started having, you know, mild acute pancreatitis. I've seen liver enzymes elevate along with the gallbladder issues, you know, and so forth. So I think of that as a triad. When we start having excessively fast weight loss, especially when somebody is just a complete hot mess of health, they've never exercised, they are completely metabolically devastated, they're extremely overweight, and they're losing excessive amounts of weight on a very high dose of one of these peptides, 
I could see how the pancreas could become a problem. So that to me made perfect sense. I'm like, well, that just, that patient wasn't managed right. The other thing to consider is diabetics. When you get into severe type two diabetes, you are looking at potential risk for gastroparesis and some of these other issues. Like these are not uncommon side effects of severe diabetes. And so we're talking apples to oranges here. There's two different groups of people that could really benefit from these drugs. And I'll talk about both of them uh, here in a few. So those are the big concerns. There were some kidney issues. I think those people had had induced severe nausea and vomiting. And so there was some damage to the kidneys, but it's crazy how these very few and far between cases are being blown way out of proportion. That's the part that's got me completely baffled. I'm like, wait a minute, why are we blowing these completely out of proportion when we've got another therapeutic intervention going around in the world with really strong data and study after study showing some severe complications, but can't talk about that, right? So, but we can, you know, poo poo all over this one because some rats got thyroid cancer and a few people got gastroparesis. Like, do you see what I'm getting at here? I'm really confused why all the hate on this. And I, again, I do think it's coming potentially from other pharmaceutical companies. That's again, totally my guess. I'm just pulling that out of my head, but uh, I, I just can't figure out after reading about these drugs. I mean, I have literally sat down every single day for the past few months. And when I think of a condition, I put in GLP-1 agonist and that condition, plus the word scholar, because that'll pull up the scholarly articles, the scientific data, and boom, there's a study on it. Almost a hundred percent. They have tested GLP-1 agonists against all of these different conditions. And in every single case, there was improvement. So I'm not saying it's the panacea for all conditions, of course, but I'm really interested in it for neuroinflammation and pain and depression and cognition, improvements in cognition, right? So I think that there's something that happens in the menopausal state with the shift in, it's not just the shift in hormones because yes, that's very acute and it's significant when we start to lose our estrogen and we start to have our testosterone dip. And of course, usually there's been some low progesterone going on for some time, but oh, oh he got a squeaky toy. <laughs> if you hear squeaking, it's puppy, but he's being a good boy. So I'm really interested in its impact on neuroinflammation, cognition, and downstream pain. Like that's really where my interest cued. When I put that into the Google and I saw the studies that came up, I was like, wait, wait, what? Why is nobody talking about this? So yes, we've got these secondary improvements in cardiovascular disease, et cetera, but that are happening in the studies of the diabetics, the, these are the step trials they're called. There, there's a series of studies called the step studies, the step trials, and they just completed one on heart failure. Get this, you guys, heart failure. They looked at non-diabetics. They put them on GLP-1 agonists with that had heart failure and there was improvement. There was improvement in the diabetics. There was improvement in the non-diabetics. I mean, name me a drug that can do that. It's reversing heart failure. This is phenomenal to me. This is just absolutely phenomenal to me. And the fact that it's being so, so vilified that anytime I see a large group of people go against something, I'm like, what is up? Like who is feeding them this? And so that's why I've been really confused at the functional medicine community, but to their defense, let's get into that. These folks are being generally put on high doses or low doses, titrated up to high doses. Not every doctor's doing this. Well, there's a lot of astute doctors out there doing this, right? There's a lot of weight loss doctors who've been using this for a long time on a lot of patients very safely, and they never get into these higher doses. But the standard, if you look these up and you look up dosing is to get up to, with semaglutide, it's to go from 0.25 milligrams up to 2.5 milligrams. So we've got people way up there in the 2.5 milligrams. They're left on it forever. They're not told to strength train. They're not told to change their diet. They're not told, they're not taught how to eat. They're not taught anything. They just experience significant weight loss with fast and furious weight loss causes, comes a lot of problems. Uh, one of them being muscle loss. So you guys have all heard about the muscle loss concern, right? And I know Dr. Peter Atia was all over it. And after he put out whatever he put out, everybody was like, well, Dr. Atia said, you guys, Anybody who knows anything, I've helped a lot of patients lose weight, a lot of patients lose weight. And we've used HCG, we've used all kinds of different things. We've used a lot of mostly natural. But when somebody loses weight 
aggressively and quickly, they tend to lose about 25 to 30% of their lean muscle mass. Guess what the percentage is on semaglutide? 25 to 30%. So it's the same. It is the side effect of a severely calorically reduced diet. That's it. It's not the semaglutide. It's not driving muscle loss. Actually, there are mechanisms in these GLP-1 agonists that drive muscle protein synthesis. So you're being lied to about that and everybody's jumping all over it. And it's cracking me up because I'm like, do any of you know anything about weight loss? Because if you look at any weight loss studies, it, the standard is to lose 25 to 30% of your muscle mass if you're not actively pursuing strength training. So these folks should all be on a strength training regimen. They should all be on a high protein diet, right? Macros on protein should be hit every day. Strength training three times a week, at least the, the bare minimum. That's how these patients should be being managed. But we, of course, know that's not how they're being managed. They're just being given the drug. They're losing the weight. They're like, look how skinny I am. Well, what happens with that is they lose sometimes more muscle mass than they do fat. So their body weight goes down significantly, but you know, it's about 50, 50 at that point for several of them. And now when they regain the fat back because they went off the peptide and they don't have any lifestyle improvements in place, they don't have any lifestyle, you know, strategies, they don't have any insulin resistant, you know, none of it's been talked about, none of it's understood. They're not living a metabolically sound life. They're not living a life conducive to good metabolic health. And then they go off the peptide and they gain the weight back. Well, now they're under muscled. They've lost a ton of muscle and they gain back all this weight and most of it's fat. So now they're fatter than they started when it comes to body composition percentages, right? Their percentage, if they started as 50% fat and 50% muscle and then, you know, and bones, soft tissue, and then they took the peptide and they whittled away and they did nothing. This is the same with any caloric restriction diet. I've seen this with keto. I've seen this so many times with keto, actually, you guys, I've seen people go on extreme keto diets and come into my office and they just look like a bag of bones. They just look like a saggy, sad, skinny person and they're frail and they never strength trained during the whole keto process, right? They just had extreme weight loss with keto. So this goes for any extreme weight loss where strength training is not emphasized and muscle synthesis is not being emphasized. So at, at least the keto folks were eating a high protein diet. So they had something going for them, but you get my drift, all this hype, all this vilification is just because it's not being done right. It's not the GLP one agonists. So we got to get that out of our heads.